بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد يسرنا القرآن للذكر فهل من مدكر صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك لمن الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين Respected viewers, brothers, sisters, elders, youngers Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I welcome you all to the Islam Q&A Iqra Bangla TV. Alhamdulillah, once again, I have with me the honorable guest, uh, the teacher, Ustad, and Muhaddith, the founder of White Thread Institute, and the teacher of Hadith, Hazrat Al-Allam, Hazrat Mufti Abdul Rahman Ibn Yusuf Mangera. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, Mufti Sahib? You okay? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah for coming today. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the tawfiq inshallah to benefit from this program today. Today inshallah we will try to focus on some masail. So the program is Islam Q&A. Uh, so I will encourage all the viewers uh, that are watching do call in any questions you have regarding Islam, anything that you have regarding your, your finance, your work, your, um, your masail, your Islam, uh, your practices, your a'mal, your fasting, your salah, anything that you want to ask, Hazrat Mufti Sab is here inshallah, he will be answering your calls. In the meantime, while we wait for your calls, inshallah, I'll try and ask some of the questions that I think uh, some of the viewers might be interested in asking Hazrat Mufti Sab inshallah and he will answer. So Mufti Sab, today we wanted to talk a little bit about our past and the coming future as well inshallah. So uh, we have, uh, we wanted to take today's program, uh, inshallah we're going to have to go for a break, but just for the audience to understand, we will be talking a little bit about Ramadan in the first segment and then we'll go towards Hajj that is coming uh, in the second segment inshallah and the last segment we will leave for yourself. Inshallah, whatever you decide, you want to talk about marriage, Hazrat Mufti Sab would like to ask, uh, answer some questions regarding marriage or answer some of the queries. Inshallah, this is how the today's program will go. So Ramadan, any masail you have, any issues you have, any doubts you have of how you spent your Ramadan, what are the masail, is your fast accepted, is it done, your sadaqatul fitr, are they done? Uh, you can ask regarding those. Second segment, Inshallah, we'll talk about Hajj because this is the season of Hajj. Uh, is it wajib on us? What, uh, what time is it wajib on us? How does it become wajib on us? If it is wajib on us, do we have to go this year? And those rela related questions, inshallah. But really, this is just a guide. You can ask any kind of questions, inshallah. And inshallah, we'll try our best to get the answers out of us at Mufti Sahib, inshallah. We're going for a little break. Inshallah, after the break, we will continue with the show. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Aapnara Dekhsen, Islamic Q&A with Ikra. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Islam Q&A with myself Shah Hamza and our Ustad, Honorable Sheikh Dr. Azrat Mufti Abdurrahman Saab. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah for having us. So inshallah this segment will get started with some uh, questions regarding Ramadan. Okay. Um, so, how was your Ramadan anyway? We'll start with that, inshallah. How was this Ramadan? Ramadan is a difficult thing to measure. I mean, I would say Alhamdulillah. I think I put too much on to myself. So, the uh, first 15 days were a bit stressed because we were trying to do too much. Mm. The last 15 days were a bit easier, even though I was traveling. So, we just ask Allah that. Allah accepted. The, I was traveling in Australia in the last 15 days. The first 15 days I was here, we were trying to do a Quran Khatam with my son uh, in Tarawi. And then we had the Quran Reflections on ZamZamAcademy.com. 
And so, you, you know, Ramadan is a time when we get an opportunity. So what we try to do is try to just stop doing everything else. We don't teach that much or anything like that and just try to spend the time to uh, focus on the Qur'an because you don't get that same kind of opportunity throughout the year. So it's the minimum that we can do. So that's why it gets a bit very busy. But otherwise, alhamdulillah, I think it was beautiful. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, yeah. Um, going into some masail, um, some some of the very basic ones, um, things like uh, a person that's asthmatic. What would you uh, give advice to him? Should they fast? Uh, and w- uh, when they do have the asthma pump, do, does the fasting break? Because it is something is medically prescribed, and they need to have it. Yeah. So um, they should first. I mean, everybody has a different level of asthma. Mm-hmm. Right, they everybody suffers differently. Yes, some people have a really bad asthma problem. Uh, generally, what we suggest to people is that they <coughs> um, th- there's various different types of pumps as well. Yes, uh, s- there's those that you t- you can take more the steroids. I think it is where it lasts for much longer. So they could do that as suhoor time. I wouldn't say don't fast. Okay. Um, Unless it's so bad that every hour or every two hours they have to take a pump because the pump does break the fast. Uh-huh. And the reason it breaks the fast is that anything that goes into the stomach would break the fast. Okay. So anything that goes down the throat, through the mouth or nose and goes down the throat into the stomach is going to break the fast. Okay. Now what happens is that while this is an aerosol, so the aerosol is used to take the medicine inside which is generally salbutamol to spray that and carry that down. So what happens is that the medicine in there, when somebody takes an asthma, and I've taken it, and I know how it uh-huh. feels, you can actually start tasting the medicine. It's not just pure gas. I it's see. not just um, unperceptible. It might be unperceptible, but you can actually definitely perceive it down. Mm-hmm. So what happens is that while a lot of it goes down into the lungs uh, through the windpipe, there is a part that gets stuck at the back of the throat and drips down and it enters the stomach and because of that it breaks the fast fast. so I mean there is another minority view that it does not break the fast but I can't agree with that view because clearly the medicine goes into the stomach and any medicine that goes into the stomach will break the fast so what we would tell people generally is that try to uh, time your medicine properly at sehri time, suhoor time and then fast and then if you have to break your fast, break it take the asthma pump and then repeat the fast later Okay, so if they have to break it, then there's no kafara. Th- there's no kafara for sure because this is obviously a need, yeah. and uh, they shouldn't mess around with this need because, while I haven't uh, experienced it myself, but there's some people. Uh, the doctors will tell you that for some people, if they don't take the asthma pump, it could get bad really quickly sometimes. Yes, it does. Yes. Everybody knows their threshold, but still they should be careful. Mm-hmm. So if they have to break it, they break it. Just like a person, if they, a person diabetic, with diabetes, yeah. if they get a hypo, as they call it, a very low blood sugar, and it starts shaking and so on, they better t- eat something. Yeah. So they better do something about it. Okay. Um, before we go to the next question, uh, I just wanted to remind the viewers, uh, respected viewers, this is a Q&A, live Q&A with Hazrat, uh, Dr. Mufti Abdul Rahman Mangira Sab. <coughs> Anybody that has any calls, any questions, sorry, uh, you can call in. Uh, the, uh, you can call in uh, live on the studio and we will take your questions inshallah and then uh, we'll present it to Azad Mufti Saab and he will answer your questions or you can uh, uh, text your questions to the mobile number uh, 0738761618 and inshallah I'll read it out to Azad Mufti Saab uh, and inshallah you'll get your answers <coughs> so you can co- text your questions or you can call live and you have your answers your questions answered by Azad Mufti Saab inshallah I'm just going to go through while where you're building up your questions or while you're thinking of them or while you're writing the text message. I'll ask a few generic questions to Hazrat Mufti Sab, inshallah. Uh, the other question was, so Mufti Sab, you said um, if it goes down the throat or, or by the nose. So injections and things like this are fine. Yes, uh, injections and so on are fine because they go through the muscular system or through the venal system, the veins. So, and they don't generally get to the stomach. Stomach, okay. And even if they do, they've not gone down through the cavity of consequence, which is the throat or nose or something like that, or the rectal area. 
Okay, so these are all absolutely fine. <coughs> so somebody that has like a, uh, I know the diabetic people, they have the EpiPen. So that's Maybe fine. that would be fine uh, if, they, <coughs> if they have very high blood sugar or they feel that for some reason they have to take that before mm. iftar or whatever. Yes. That's fine. Okay, perfect. Moving on to the next question. Um, this is this is an issue. Uh, a lot of the um, diabetes again is Ill illness related, and especially now. Uh, I mean, slowly, slowly, Ramadan is getting shorter. Uh, but some of the uh, people that know they can't fast, like we discussed about the um, the people that have asthma, and they're quite severe in their asthma. And they need to take it quite regularly. Um, so they know they can't fast. So from before, how well beforehand can they give? I mean, what can they give? What can they do in Ramadan? Uh, because they know they're not going to fast or is it fidya or do they have to do um, repeat it in the shorter days what is it that yeah. they have to do and can they do it early can they do it before ramadan or do they have to do it after ramadan or in ramadan yeah so anybody who can't fast in the month of ramadan mm -hmm. meaning during those days uh, sometimes people have a sickness or illness or pregnancy related yes. complications or whatever they're not allowed to pay a fidna, a fidya. It, it, it doesn't transfer to a fidya straight away. They have, to be, they have to try and fast in other shorter days. So for example, in December, we're going to fast about 12 hours or less. Well, less hours, actually. It's probably much less than it's yes, not yes, even 12 hours. Less, eight, six it's from sometimes. about yeah, eight, yeah, seven to eight. It's yeah. probably about 10 hours or so, or, yes, yes. or probably less than that. Mm -hmm. They should try to fast in those days. Now, if there is a person who can't even fast in those days, they have some kind of really critical illness which doesn't allow them to fast even you know, more than six hours or whatever, then only those people can pay a fidya, uh, which is an expiation, right? It's, uh, and it's the same <coughs> amount as your sadaqat al-fitr every year, which is three, four pounds per fast. Per fast, yeah. The issue with that is that if you pay and then you become better, there's a miracle cure or mashallah, you just become better then you would actually have to fast all those makeups that you've missed and even paid for. Yeah. Which is fine, I guess you could do that. Mm -hmm. And you can pay for the month after the month has begun. So as soon as the first day of the month has uh, taken place, then and you know that you cannot fast in Ramadan and you will never be able to fast for the rest of your life. You're a very old person or something like that. Or you've got some really... Uh, critical illness that you, you know you don't expect to fast. Then you you can't you can't pay for the Ramadan before it even begins. Some people like to just pay, but it's like it's not even obligatory on you. So why would you be paying for something that is not even obligatory for you? Mm. So the condition is that at least the the month begins and then you can pay for all 30 days if you want to. Otherwise you can pay on the last day or after Ramadan. Mm -hmm. So that 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 would be the fidya. System. Fidya. <coughs> The next one, we, uh, we've got a call, alhamdulillah. So we'll go to the call, inshallah. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Am I in the show, brother? You are speaking live on the show. How are you, brother? You okay? Alhamdulillah, brother. I, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Sheikh, jazakumullah khair for coming. Uh, my question to you, Sheikh, we have Muslim uh, different kinds of groups uh, within the communities and... Uh, we try to, some of us, very strict, like they don't want to get together, they don't want to sit with another group, they don't want to talk to another group, they just uh, like to be with, the, with their own groups. So how do you advise to those brothers and, I mean, to us? Uh, I mean, how, what, what should we do, Chef? Um, I, I mean, I'm trying to understand what your exact question is, like what do you want to do? What is the objective that you're trying to achieve? Uh, basically, my... My question is like we, we have we have so many different types of groups, and the brothers they try to stick to their groups and they don't want to get together, they don't want to sit with another group, they don't want to talk to another group. So how do you advise to those brothers like who are really really like strictly follow their own groups, not uh, you know take the whole uh, Muslim as a ummah? I, I hope you understand my question now. No, I, I think I'm going to need more information. Um, like, what is the, uh, I mean, explain to, I, I mean, not that I'm against putting them together. I'm just wondering, can you give me... What are the divisions? What divisions like, are like, we talking about? Like, like, and like give me a, a specific yeah. scenario who you're trying to get together. Okay, I understand where you're coming from. All right, so basically, for example, if someone uh, celebrates small lead, for example, 
you have a group, some, uh, they celebrate more than there's another group, they don't celebrate more than. Now, they are like completely against with each other. And they don't want, they don't talk to each other, they don't sit with each other, they don't go to their most, uh, each other's. So my question is, how can we, you know, come together and, you know, become one Uma instead of different groups? Okay. Like strong yeah, so look, this is a bit of a complicated question. and There's a bit of a complicated answer here. Um, again, I'm not sure who you relate to because I, I mean, I'm not sure which group you're specifically speaking about when when you say that uh, some do molded and some don't do uh, some don't do molded. At the end of the day, let's put it this way: every masjid should be open and should allow for anybody to come and pray. Now, yeah. if there's somebody who's missing jama'ah, right, because he doesn't agree with a particular group, unless they are very extreme, the only time that you can actually, uh, you see the differences in our ummah, they are of m multiple types, or of, you can say, different intensities. Yeah. Uh, some differences are light differences, they're basic differences, they're superficial differences they're not that big anybody who makes a big issue out of them they're wasting their time and they're probably complicating the matter further and because they're not real differences they are you know two ways about something maybe just difference of opinions and they're both correct you get some cases where it gets more critical and then you get some which gets extremely critical so in some cases there would be some people who would be doing complete full-on innovation and then it gets worse than that and it could, they could even hold kufri beliefs like you have the Ahmadis and Qadianis for example yes, yes, All right. Yes, yes. so now that's why th th that's basically why I'm, I mean I don't want to broaden the subject because this is a massive topic but I'll mention a few different points to you when I have to pray if I find a mosque of the Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah I will go and pray there, right? Yes. Because yes. the Prophet Sallallahu said, Sallu khalfa kulli barrin wa fajirin. Mm. Pray behind every righteous and unrighteous person. Yes. Yes. Now, the jurists do mention that to pray behind somebody who's, to make it a habit of praying behind a sinner, a transgressor, a reprehensible innovator, right? That it eventually will be makruh. Because why do you make such a person your imam? Yes. You should make a person your imam who's not like that. Saying, yes. So that's why I, I would rather say that if you're going to ask a question specifically about that, then you would probably better off asking about the very specific circumstance. Mm -hmm. This other point, there's a lot of people who have this utopian idea, right, that the ummah should come together. Right, the ummah should come together. And there should be no differences of opinion. Everything should be just one opinion. Now the thing is that that's a utopian idea and I think pretty much I think it's a pipe dream. I'm not there to increase differences. We, we want to try to minimize differences but we're going to have to accept that there will be differences. Yeah. So I think what's really important is to actually learn how to navigate differences which is what the brother is trying to say that yeah. people should at least learn to navigate differences. Yeah. I would disagree that you would probably get away with uh, yeah. you know you could do away with differences in fact, the one dua of the Prophet ﷺ that was not accepted was a dua that may my ummah never differ. The dua that the Prophet ﷺ made where he said my ummah should never be destroyed entirely, like uprooted yeah. completely, accepted. Mm -hmm. But the dua that he made that my, may my ummah never differ, that wasn't accepted. That doesn't mean that we should differ. Yeah. We don't want to be guilty of differing. Mm. But... What we need to understand, just like for example, let's just say, I guess let me give you a, probably a more um, serious issue, which is which day the Eid is on, hmm. right? Hmm. Now I fully believe that it should be on one day, right? However, I'm completely happy with those people, uh, meaning happy in the sense that I, am, I would say Eid Mubarak to people who do it on the other day. Yes. Okay. All I tell people in this case is that you should do a research for yourself before you do any argument, before you try to convince anybody else. Just because your masjid does a particular day and now you're trying to consider everybody who does something different wrong, mm. is not worth it. 
because mm. you have no basis to stand on. You're just literally blindly following your masjid. You don't know why they do it that way or the other way. Have you gone and explored the other way? Mm. So I would suggest to people that they explore and uh, then if they want to speak about something. But we have enough divisions in our ummah, we don't want to create more division. i give you an example. If your hearts are open, then it doesn't matter what the division is, you'll be fine. Hmm. Otherwise, if your hearts are constrained and you have basically somebody has mischief in their hearts, then you can create a problem even between brothers, yes. right? Even between sisters, even between relatives. There was a, a town in South Africa where a friend of mine used to be the imam. And they were both Shafi'is and Hanafis that used to be part, a big, major part of the community. They used to pray Tarawih together. And then for the Witr, the Shafi'is used to pray in one area, the Witr their style, the two and one separately. And the Hanafis would pray three together. And this had been going on for years and they were all happy. There was no problem. Apparently it looked like there was a division, but they were happy. Right? Then what happened is that they had a new Imam. And this new Imam came and he said, what is this fitna that you guys have been doing? What is this conflict? What is this difference? So he said, we must do it together. So he tried, he, he pushed everybody to do witr together. Now, you can only do it in one style. You can't do it in two styles. Mm -hmm. So you either do it three together, you do two and one separately. Whichever one you do, the other group is not happy. Mm -hmm. So apparently everybody was on one platform now doing the same thing. But now what happens is that they in their hearts they have a conflict with one another because they're not happy so the world is full of differences let us celebrate our differences the good differences and let us minimize our own differences with others and let us try to extend our hands and assist one another because as a ummah the muslim ummah we have bigger issues right that's why you'll hardly ever see me um, you know making a big deal for nothing about another group for nothing unless another group is causing a fitna or a particular group, even if any group is calling a, causing a fitna, your own group, uh, some members of your own group is causing trouble and mischief, then you speak against them. Okay, because that's going to have to happen. Yes. So I hope that's a bit helpful because it's not as simple as like, just do away with it. It's not going to be, I mean, the, uh, uh, somebody, uh, one, yeah. Abu Ja'far al-Mansur, I think it was him, uh, the Abbas al-Khalif, he asked Imam Malik that, you know what, let me make your book the law for everybody to follow. Imam Malik said no. Because the Prophet ﷺ did multiple things. Yes. And somehow all those multiple things are, mashallah, you know, different people are doing all those multiple things. Whether that be raising the hands before and after ruku, not raising them, which I consider to be the stronger view, the later view, for example. But, alhamdulillah, you know. So... Uh, I think let's just learn how to deal with our differences, which is what you are exactly asking. Yeah. Uh, so may Allah open up our hearts and... Amen. Amen. So it's more that. to do with tolerating the differences or accepting the differences rather than uniting everyone to come to one uh, yeah, and active... Yeah. And minimizing differences mm -hmm. and not causing more differences. Yes. We've got enough out there already. Exactly. Yes. exactly. Yeah. Do we have another caller? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I right. have a quick question for Mufti. Yes. Um, my question to Mufti is, is niqab compulsory? And is niqab is compulsory, there? did you say? Yes, is niqab compulsory? Uh -huh. And as is, then why is it during five times salah we're not supposed to be in niqab? Say that again. Why, why, even what, during hajj. Oh, niqab, niqab. Is niqab yes. compulsory? Yes. Okay. Compulsory, yes. Oh, and if it is, then why in during our five times salah? Okay, if it is, then not, why? In, yes. It's okay. not needed, yes. And yeah. during hajj, yeah. we are even more exposed to more men during hajj. Yeah. So why mm. then we should not be okay. in niqab? Okay. Jazakallah khair. Mm. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Very nice question. So, so the niqab... Uh, uh, there's a few th in, in within those questions. There's a few things. There's, there's a bit of a confusion. So I'll, I'll clarify the confusion. Uh -huh. Firstly, the niqab. The idea of the niqab is to cover your face and veil your face, right? So according to two madhabs, which is the Hanbali and the Shafi'i madhabs, 
niqab is compulsory for them. That is, the, uh, as far as I understand, the default view of their madhabs. I know that not necessarily every Shafi'i woman follows that, but as far as I know, that's what they consider the face to be part of the nakedness of a woman and that it must be covered. Right? The Hanafis and Marikis, their view is that by default it's not a fard, it's not an obligation, but it's an obligation when there's a fitna, when there's temptation that could be coming about. And there's a clear temptation between men and women. I mean, that's something that... I know some people like to downplay that whole idea or say that, uh, you know, there is no such thing. But all the research shows, I mean, all the research shows the mental uh, research of, uh, of men attracted to women, women attracted to men, but definitely men attracted to women. And that's just the natural fitra, right, that we are. And that's why um, th there is the hukum for niqab whenever there's a fitna. And, and so scholars like Ibn Abidin al-Shami uh, probably from about just over 200 years ago said that this is a time of fitna right and that was 200 years ago now we're li living in a much more hyper sexualized world so I guess they would say that it would be wajib so that is the view there are other ulama who say that it's not wajib necessarily right and then you get some groups uh, some um, some some uh, would you call it uh, some scholars who uh, may even say that it's actually not even part of the Sharia, which I completely disagree with. The Prophet's wives, Ali Muslim, used to do niqab. And niqab has been throughout our tradition, so it's very difficult to deny it completely. All right? What I generally tell women that, look, the wives of the Prophet وسلم, Ummahatul Mu'mini, the best of the women, eventually did it. Right? They did it. Initially, there was no hukum for niqab. And when it came, then they did niqab. Aisha radiallahu anha and everybody else. Even though Aisha was quite young at the time, she was only 18 when the Prophet ﷺ passed away. Right? And that's told from the story of, for example, we have the story of where she was slandered yes. in that story, right? Mm. Yes. So the yes. Sahabi yes. said that I recognized her because I'd seen her before the niqab. Yeah. And then when he came, he, when she found out he was there, she covered up. Right? So that, that's basically the hukum of niqab. But so what I uh, just yeah. just before we move on from there. So in terms of uh, establishment, is it in the Quran? Niqab uh, could be understood from the Quran. This is where many have understood it from the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan nabiyyu, qul li azwajik wa banatik, wa nisa'il mu'mineen, yudnina alayhinna min jalabibihim. That they should, uh, uh, O oh Prophet, you should tell your uh, wives uh, and your daughters and the believing women that they should drape over them their jalabib, their jilbab. Yeah. Now, those who consider niqab to be necessary say this is what it means. It means niqab. Mm. Others who say it's not necessary say that that is not what it means, but that it means uh, draping uh, another part of the garment. But that doesn't mean that they deny niqab, uh, yeah. like just because this verse isn't there. Mm. Right? So that is where uh, the ulama have taken it from. As I said, it is a differed uh, upon uh, uh, view. Uh, so this is what I tell women. Right? I say to them, if you can't do it today, maybe you can intend to do it tomorrow. But don't write it off, right? Because it is definitely a sunnah. According to many scholars, it's a wajib. According to some scholars, it's a fard. But it definitely is a sunnah of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. And anybody who says that it's not part of the deen or it's an innovation or whatever, they have no evidence for that. You know, they have no, there is no evidence to that because the ummah has been doing this throughout from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina Munawwara only the slaves were not allowed to wear niqab that's what I tell women I said and likewise you know anything else like that for a man to keep a beard for example right the beard is either ex uh, a, a very very emphasized sunnah or a wajib right and they say look if you can't do it today well do it tomorrow intend to do it tomorrow intend to do it one day that way at least you're not just saying, I'm not going to do something. Okay? Uh, if you can't do it, it's uh, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Allah knows everybody's situation. But at least intend that Allah give me that ability. Now going to Salat. So, in Salat, Salat is generally performed in the privacy of your home. And you can wear a niqab to pray Salat. There's nothing wrong with that. There's a misunderstanding that your Salat is not valid without a, with a niqab. And that's actually incorrect. That's actually incorrect. There's a, I get that question sometimes that we can't pray with a niqab on. I mean, obviously it's better to keep it up because then your face is touching the ground. But already we've got carpets and prayer mats and everything in between us and the ground anyway. 
right? So it's not wrong. And it's not even blameworthy or incorrect, right, to pray with a niqab. And so that's a misunderstanding. You can definitely pray with it. Oh. Okay? So that's salat done. When it comes to hajj, the obligation is to not uh, cover your face, i.e., what the ulama have understood is not to let the cloth touch the face. So, yes, it's a place where there's, uh, it's a time when there's a lot more people and so on. Now, if you look at the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, she explains how they used to do it. She says that we weren't allowed to cover our face, but every time, but they were in a howdaj. They were in a howdaj, the palanquin on, on the camel. Right? So they weren't necessarily. And even if they were somewhere where they came across people, the hadith very clearly says that we would take the edge of our you know, garment and we would cover, you know, we would place it over our face like that so that it would be covered. So that our faces would not be exposed. That's why um, many ulama. Throughout the centuries have come up with different contraptions, right? Many women have come up with different contraptions. Uh, some actually, you see, they just wear the niqab and then they pay them, some pay them, or the, some say that, well, covering our face is more important because there's too many people, so they've probably changed the fatwa. I don't necessarily agree with that. Mm -hmm. But they, they, they say, just cover the face, it doesn't matter. You don't even have to pay them because covering the face is more important. It's a bigger fitna than, you know, having it open. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that. However, we've come up with creative ways to do that. So what some do is that they have this hat, a cap mm. with a kind of a, a visor mm. and then they just drape the cloth over that so that it's not touching the face because that's what's impermissible. Yeah. Right? And then uh, another one is uh, some would, someone could wear a very long brimmed hat uh, and, 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 and so on. Mm. So there's other ways that they can but do these, that. These, so these ideas, they're obviously, are they, are they coming from the Sunnah or is it because? No, because we don't know what the women at that time, the way they used to do it, except from Aisha radiallahu anh, she, said, mm. she used to take a cloth and do that. So you can do that if you want to. Okay. But, uh, okay, so, um, so coming back to her, what's it called? So her question was that um, if, if it is compulsory, then why is it not so in Hajj? Because Hajj has a different rule. Okay. Hajj has a different rule. I mean, it's it, and the reason for the compulsory nature of it is to cover the face for fitna. Uh -huh. So the the way the ulama have reconciled this is that what is really prohibited is the touching of the face with the cloth. Mm. So they're saying that instead of that, let's observe both. We're not going to have the cloth touch our face. We're going to have it extended. So that way, because there's a fitna, mm -hmm. right? You don't want to be distracting or attracting or whatever the case is. So that's why they do both. Okay. So that's how they reconcile the two together. Chalo, Jazakallah. I hope that answers the question, sister. Uh, we'll have another caller. Let's go to the caller, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Uh, my question is uh, to Musti Saab. Your, your voice is very, uh, uh, very uh, familiar. Mama, okay, continue, continue. Okay. Which Muslim Imam Abu Hanifa used to follow? Was there any Muslim before him? Which Muslim uh, Imam Abu Hanifa used to follow? And was there any Muslim before him? That's yeah, the question. He, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, used to follow the Hanafi Muslim. And that was the that was the madhab from before. Okay. I mean, if that's the kind of question you have, then that is the answer essentially. Because uh -huh. Imam Abu Hanifa, you see, this question, my assumption is that it's coming from this perspective that the madhab is an innovation. Madhab is something new and it conflicts with Quran and Sunnah. That's I think where this uh, question mm -hmm. is stemming from. Okay. And the reason for this is that um, a lot of the time these kind of questions come because you've read a narrative without really understanding how it happened mm. okay you've come uh, you know somebody and I'm not saying that's what the brother may have had maybe mm. he's asking for somebody else I don't yeah. know what the reasoning is so it's not about the brother but this question right so the idea is that Imam Abu Hanifa just like Imam al awzai a contemporary of his Imam Layth ibn Sa'ad uh, Imam Layth ibn Sa'ad was in Egypt Imam Awzai was in Sham Damascus Imam Abu Hanifa was in Kufa and you had Ata ibn Abi Rabah and others, Rahimahumullah, you know, in Mecca, for example. And then you had others in Medina Munawara, Imam Malik was in Medina Munawara, like a contemporary. All of these people, 
what was happening is that they were getting new questions, new events were occurring, and there was no clear cut guidance of that in the Quran and Sunnah. Mm -hmm. Like there was nothing explicit in the Quran and Sunnah about it because they were, these were new issues. They'd never occurred in the Sahaba's time. So what they started doing was that they started to look at the Quran and Sunnah and come up with answers. Imam Malik came up with answers in Medina Munawwara. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, in Kufa, along with some other scholars, the Ibrahim and Nakhai and a number of others, they were all doing this work, mm. right? And in you had Layth ibn Sa'ad and, and, and others in different in different parts of the world. That's what they were doing. Now what happened is that there were some differences among them. Mm -hmm. Imam Malik reached a conclusion that the hand should be kept like this in prayer, based on what he observed of the people of Medina Munawwara, who had who had been, you know, who had learnt from the people who'd been with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? So, I'm not going to say that he had no basis whatsoever. I don't do that. I don't agree with it. But I'm not going to say he had no basis. Imam Abu Hanifa reached a different conclusion based on a number of hadith that Ali radiallahu anhu said that it's a sunnah to join your hands together below your navel. Hanbalis do the same thing. Shafi'is they do it above. Uh, they do it above the navel. There's also an opinion maybe about the chest. You have these multiple hadiths. Now, which one were they going to take? They mm -hmm. took whatever they thought was the strongest. Whatever they thought made the most sense in terms of the other hadith. Now what happens is that whatever Imam Awza'i rahimahullah had prepared or, and so on, and Imam Layth ibn Sa'ad, that didn't really continue. The teachings of Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi'i, Imam uh, Malik, they dominated. So we had multiple strands who so all were, took from the Quran Sunnah. So there were, were other madhahib. There were a number of other madhahib. Imam Tabari had one. Mm -hmm. uh, there was Dawud al Zahiri had one. But none of them lived. None mm -hmm. of them endured. Only these four for some reason endured. Even though Imam Shafi came so much that Imam Ahmad came even after him. Mm -hmm. And his endured. Right? Because maybe just people were attracted to that. There was a barakah in there. Whatever the case was. All of them are Quran and Sunnah. All of them are Quran and Sunnah. Nowadays, you've had in the last 20 years these people who are trying to say that it's, uh, these are bid'at or whatever. So then you get questions like this. That, what mother was Imam Abu Hanifa? Well, Imam Abu Hanifa was a Muslim, just like we are Muslims. And whatever he did, he did the Hanafi madhab because that's what he then taught to others. That's essentially what the, Imam Shafi was a, uh, uh, followed the Shafi madhab. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. Move this up. We've got uh, one more call. Uh, we'll take the question and then we'll have to go to break. Assalamu alaikum. Rahmatullahi barakatuh. Alaykum. Alaykum salam. Rahmatullah, brother. How are you? Alhamdulillah. How are you, brother? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah for calling. Uh, what's your question? Uh, I, I want one question for with the uh, Muftisar. Yes, go ahead. Is, uh, you know, is the uh, wind is um, we lose the tip. You know. Then uh, you um, say, say that again. What was the question? Say tip. You know. Teeth. Teeth. Yeah. Teeth like. Uh, the, you know, teeth, lose, lose your teeth, you know, when you yeah, go yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, when is the, the NHS give you some is the replacement of plastic one? Someone you can put the privately implant or implant, what you call. They, they put it the drilling or something like that. They put the, uh, permanently something. Yeah. So, I asked to someone, they say that is not halal. Okay. So, so I want to, know, to ask you, this is his... Uh, is it halal or haram? Okay, inshallah. So, I'll ask Mufti Sab that. They this... give me an example. If you pass away with the false teeth, then Allah SWT will be asking to you, you come with the... What, whichever I give you to, why is that one? And okay. you got the thing with the, you, it's false one. That is not halal or something like that. Okay. So, so I want to know, please, because I lose something, you know, but, you know. So I want to put a false one. So someone said that is not halal. Okay, okay. I got your question. Just, uh, just to repeat your question again. So you're asking when the teeth come off, there's a new surgery where they, they fill it in. They, they get a new one, they screw it in and they make a new one. And you're saying, is that yeah, halal? Yeah, yeah, yeah? that's the meaning. Yeah. Okay, Jazakallah. Jazakallah for your question. That will be permanently, yes, you know, that will not uh, uh, you'll be way out of something. Is that the implants you're talking about? The implants, right? yes, yes. Yeah, the implants and this are... is a halal Islam we want now. Jazakallah. Jazakallah for your question, brother. Jazakallah, inshallah, Azat Mufti Sab will answer the question. Uh, after a short break, inshallah, we'll be back after the break. Just keep watching, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
আপনারা দেখছেন ইসলামিক কিউএনএ উইথ ইকরা আসসালামু আলাইকুম ওয়া রাহমাতুল্লাহি ওয়া বারাকাতুহু ওয়েলকাম ব্যাক টু ইসলাম কিউএনএ মাই সেলফ শাহ হামজা এন্ড দ্য অনরেবল গেস্ট উইথ মি টুডে আলহামদুলিল্লাহ ইজ आवर डियर উস্তাদ ডক্টর হযরত মুফতি আব্দুর রহমান মাঙ্গেরা দ্য ফাউন্ডার অফ হোয়াইট থ্রেড ইনস্টিটিউট the teacher of hadith at Imam Zakaria Academy. Assalamu alaikum Mufti sir. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How how is it going today? Alhamdulillah. 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 I think Alhamdulillah. we, we interesting have a lot questions. more questions. Yes. Yes. Uh, dearest viewers, inshallah, continue to ask your questions inshallah. You can text your questions to our uh, text number. It's 07387616816. You can call in live. That's 02070960 uh 0405 uh you ca- uh, we've got mufti sab we've got we've also got a facebook page for islam q and a uh, and there's a brother that has asked a question on the facebook uh regarding should we answer the other one first okay yes yes that. sorry sorry before the, the before the uh, break we had we had a question from a brother regarding the implants so um so the question i'll just repeat it again for the new viewers uh the brother asked the question he said um uh there's a there's a um uh, misunderstanding out there or there's a saying out there that anyone that uh, removes their teeth and uh, puts implants in this is haram this is not allowed is this true yeah i mean to be honest anybody who's going to do that would only do it because they have very bad teeth and there's a lot of people who have bad teeth so what they're doing is they're actually putting implants what they do is they have a a screw that's uh, fitted into the jaw bone and then they actually have a crown that's placed on top it takes uh, some time to get it done but it's very expensive in the UK so people are going to turkey to do it where it's like a fraction of the price apparently so there's a lot of people who are doing it even in bangladesh is a, is a good treatment there bangladesh so mashallah they're much yeah. cheaper than the UK i yes, guess so yes. that's probably why it's become very very popular and there's nothing wrong with that if you've got bad teeth i mean i think it'd be If you if you do it for purely cosmetic reasons then there's an issue with that right if somebody is getting their teeth filed or in a particular way there's some discussion about that but most people or many people that are having implants it's because they're losing their teeth and it's very difficult to wear braces or dentures or whatever so then they, they these are more permanent 20 years or or more so there's nothing wrong with that and the question that what if, what if Allah is going to ask you that where's the teeth that I gave you well if they dropped out or they decayed then i mean you don't want to offer that to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anyway i mean i mean that's a joke but you know what i'm saying that if they've decayed or if they've fallen out then what are you <coughs> going to do you know um that's what happens your nails you cut them and then you know they they grow more and if there's anything else you know you get you can have a surgery there's no problem with that i'll give you an example there's a hadith in uh, tirmidhi uh, jami' at-tirmidhi the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam somebody his nose got cut off right his nose got cut off yes so he took a he got a nose made of a silver subhanallah but then that caused um some decay and it it didn't react very well with the body so then the prophet some said do it with gold now gold is actually haram mm-hmm. generally but as a ilaj it's fine so if you're doing this for need then there's nothing wrong with that it's just like getting a crown put on or getting fillings put in, put in or getting a whole new tooth put in with a bridge for example there's nothing wrong with that kind of stuff yes there's some issues if you're just doing something for purely you got no problem with it just doing it for cosmetic reasons that you know you want to look make it look better in a certain way then in that case there may be an issue but consult your scholar about that so uh, building on from that uh, because you mentioned that in the time of sahaba mashallah they were doing plastic surgery even then mashallah but they were doing it with silver it and gold it was metal surgery yeah, yeah metal there was surgery. no plastic in those days yeah <laughs> Uh, so just building from that so because obviously rasulullah sallallahu himself advised that the man should wear gold or try gold for his nose uh, uh, coming back to the dentures uh, sometimes if it doesn't react very well they can even men can resort to gold absolutely to i mean gold has been used for them because they works very well that's why because i think gold just works very well with the body from what i've been told it doesn't have a bad reaction okay and that's why they use that is it something to do with people that are made of gold maybe gold works better with them i'm just joking okay we'll go to the yeah. we'll go to the next question inshallah uh so this this question this brother has asked on facebook um he says assalamu alaikum i would like to ask um uh, why men in islam are not allowed to uh, wear silk 
Uh, is it pure silk that they're not allowed to wear or can't they wear any clothes that uh, uh, with silk uh, mixed? Right. So why men are not allowed to wear, I don't know the wisdom and the reason behind it. Forgive me, I don't know the reason behind that. Why men are and women are not. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, you know, refine things like that, not for men or whatever, but I'm not sure. It's just that's the hukum, that's the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we abide by it. G moving on to the question of what is not allowed is that it's pure silk. Where the, see, any fabric, any fabric you have is made up of the, the weft and the warp. Meaning the down strokes of the, uh, what thread. you call it, the threads. And then you have the main filler threads, which is called the, uh, the weft. All right? That's the bulk of it. So according to, as far as I understand, the, 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 there's one view that any part silk would not be allowed. However, the Hanafis, they say that if it's not dominantly silk, then you can wear it. So if, if for example, you have... If I, if for example, I had silk uh, finishing embellishment on here, that would be allowed. So as long as it's less than four fingers in width, as long as it's less than four fingers in width, you're allowed. So for example, if I had a band here, or here, or shoulder pads made out of silk, or uh, 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 you know a finishing here made out of silk, that would be allowed. As long as the the main part of the garment is not silk, that's allowed. So you can have silk finishing if you really want to. Okay. Right? Uh, so just like that, just like gold. For example, if you had gold embroidery, that would be allowed as well, even though men are not allowed to wear gold. So I couldn't wear a garment of gold if it was gold stitched with gold thread, for example. But I can have gold embellishment, right? Uh, whether on the turban, whether anywhere. As long as it's less than four fingers in width. In length, it can be any, any, anyone, right? So... Jazakallah. Yeah. Jazakallah. I hope that answers the brother's question uh, uh, that was regarding silk. We have another caller and we have also a question on the Facebook, inshallah. Uh, we'll go to the caller first. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you, brother? You okay? Alhamdulillah, I'm okay. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah for calling. Go ahead. What's your question? So my question to Mutasab is um, I was asked to sort of ask somebody regarding this um, question this brother had. The question is in relation to Zakat. Uh -huh. So this, the brother here, brother lives in the UK, he's got siblings in Bangladesh, uh -huh. and his siblings are not that well off. So is he able to give Zakat to them when they, you know, ask him for medical costs and school fees and contribution to, to a marriage and things like that? Is mm. he able to give them Zakat without having to tell them? Because they're not, okay. they're not poor, nor are they rich. They're just, they're just managing. But when it comes to these tasks or these, these you know, special occasions, uh -huh. they can't afford to mm. pay for those things. And okay. the second thing is, yeah, the brother, he also paid about 150 pounds towards the water pump because somebody asked him to um, help them plant a water pump in their, on their land so that they have access to water. So he gave about 150 pounds from his zakat money without telling them towards that. So is his zakat uh, valid now? Is, is mm -hmm. there, is, has he discharged his duty? Yeah. Uh, so with with the, with the, can I, if I can just add more stuff, sorry. Uh, with the, with the a hand pump that he gave, is that hand pump, is that communal or is that personal, it's private? It's, it's private to one particular family. It's private to a family or individual? To, to a particular family. So family. this person would have access to it. Their whole family would have access. It's a private And family. the family is uh, Zakat eligible? This particular family is Zakat eligible, I believe, yes. Okay. Okay. That's all. Yeah. Um, right. So there's, there's basically three issues here, right? Number one, can you give them Zakat or not? Right. So Brothers, you can... Siblings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in terms of who you can give Zakat to and who you can't give Zakat to, essentially when it comes to your family, you can give Zakat to anybody... So the easiest way to remember this is to remember who you cannot give zakat to. You can't give zakat up and down. Mm. Okay? So you can't give zakat up and down. That's it. So you can't give zakat, which means to your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents and above. And you cannot give zakat downwards, which means you can't give zakat to your own children, grandchildren and so on. Right? However, you can give zakat sideways and diagonally. Which basically means you can give zakat to your brothers and sisters and diagonally to uncles, uh, great uncles, etc. and nephews and nieces. 
So the only people in your family you can't give to are your parents and no. grandparents and children and grandchildren and your spouse, your wife. You can't give to your wife. Okay? Now, the, uh, since these are his brothers, he can give them zakat. His sisters, he can give them zakat as long as they're uh, eligible for zakat. That's what you have to then look at. Are they eligible for zakat? If they're eligible for zakat, which means that they don't possess um, enough of the quantum, basically the nisab, if they don't possess that, or maybe they've got a major debt, or they're just about eating hand to mouth, then yes, they can have zakat as long as they, and as long as they don't have any excess um, uh, assets that they don't use. If they've got a piece of land that they don't use, and that is the value of a nisab of zakat, and they don't use it. They, they wouldn't be able to receive zakat even though, even though they won't have to give zakat But they can't receive zakat um, I, I don't want to go into great depth here about that But go to zamzamacademy.com There's about 15 to 20 short short clips On each of these specific matters In, in greater depth So uh, I'm going to answer it briefly here But for more you can, you can go there Then number three One was he gave you can give them zakat and you don't have to tell them that it's zakat. As long as they are mm -hmm. eligible for zakat, you can say this is a gift. You can say this is a loan and then forgive it. So you don't have to tell them it's zakat. And the hand pump, as long as you're making... You see in zakat, you have to make somebody owner of something. Mm -hmm. So if you're making uh, somebody there or two people or three people who are all eligible for zakat... If you're making them the owner of that hand pump, then that's fine as well. So basically what that means is that you can't just go and um, set up a hand pump somewhere in the middle of a village or something and nobody owns it, everybody owns it, because then nobody owns it. And that's not allowed, because in zakat you have to give uh, constructive ownership to somebody. You have to transfer it to like, this is yours now, so they can do what they want with it. So hopefully that answers all of your questions. Jazakallah. Jazakallah Mufti Sab. The other question that we have from Facebook, a brother has asked. Uh, Salaamu Alaikum. I would like to know what the ruling is on celebrating birthdays. Celebrating birthdays, um, many, many ulama now are not seeing birthdays as uh, a religious uh, or any longer at least a religious um, what do you call it a religious Specific. celebration uh, due to which they say that there's no kufr or shirk or even sin in doing so I personally do not celebrate birthdays never have um, and never want to uh, because I, I think it's really a time that you should probably think more about you know, if there's something to celebrate for, I guess, like, you know, Alhamdulillah, I've achieved all of this and, you know, it's a milestone, then you can, you can probably celebrate that at any time. But I don't really see the point of that. I know some people see it. Alhamdulillah, that's up to them. I'm not going to call it haram. And uh, many ulama do not even call it sinful anymore because it's something that is done throughout the world and not just by Christians or something like that. Even though it may have started with that, but it's not really a religious tradition as such. So, and then there's the other view, which is that still birthdays are, should not be done, and it's wrong to celebrate birthdays. So there are both of these views. So I don't condemn anybody that does it, but I do not encourage it either. Uh, if on that uh, note, um, the brother hasn't asked this, but on that note, because this is a very um, today kind of issue, it's very contemporary. Uh, there are, there are um, we've got a caller, so we'll go to the caller first, inshallah, and then I'll ask you again. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brother. Uh, how are you, brother? You okay? Alhamdulillah. I had a question. Sorry, I just came late and I saw you talking about zakat. And I thought, I've always had a question, but I didn't know how to ask a scholar. And I feel a bit embarrassed to ask. Not uh, a problem. Not a problem. TV, I can ask you. Subhanallah. Allah accept, inshallah. Allah accept. Mashallah, you ahead. felt embarrassed to um, ask uh, privately a scholar. Now you're asking on live TV, <laughs> mashallah. <laughs> Barakah, mashallah. Yes. Tell us. <laughs> so maybe I was going to So what it is. It's about zakat, I just want to know, um, so basically, um, when I look at my earnings and things, I don't feel, no, I ain't got savings for a year or anything. So I, um, I was away for a bit, um, I was a bit in trouble in life, so I was away for a bit. But what it is, I purchased my mum's house quite a long time ago, uh, like a right to buy. And my mum lives there, so do I have to still give zakat or... So is, uh, your, your, so essentially your question is, is there zakat on purchased house? 
Is that right? Yeah, and if my if I've not got savings for a year, I've not saved up, you know, like saving money for a year. You know, what do I pay the cost? You know, am, am I am I all right not to pay the cost, or am I meant to pay the cost? So you don't have anything at the moment. No, no saving. Just, just uh, the property value is is gone up, but obviously I don't have any. You don't have cash, cash money. No. Uh, in your bank or in uh, anywhere else? No. Under your pillow, maybe. I'm no. just joking. Okay, so there's no, there's no, there's no uh, cash or any kind of savings, and you've just got a property, and the property is, you have a lot of value to it, yes? Yeah. And the property is yours? Uh, it's my, it's, it's my mum's, I helped her to get, to get, do the right to buy it. Okay, yeah, okay. There's, no, there's, no, there's, no, there's no difference to that. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, anything else, brother? Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, so I, I'm basically pay as you earn, so, so I earn and I spend, I earn and I spend, so... I'm not really saving anything, so yeah. Okay, that's perfect, how it is. perfect. Got your question, inshallah. Uh, keep watching. Rahla. Azad Mufti Sab will answer Rahla. your question, inshallah. Mufti Sab, we've yeah. got a few more callers. We'll pile up, pile up a few questions and then we'll answer them all together, inshallah. Okay, well, uh, we'll just give quick answers then, otherwise. Okay, go yeah. ahead. Okay, so this is very simple. There is no zakat on your on the house that you have purchased for your for you and your mum to live in, or just for your mum to live in. Any house that you have for a need that is being used, it's not for business purposes, which means that you are not trying to sell it, you didn't buy it to sell it, then there's no zakat on that. Even houses that you've got that you might be renting out and receiving a rent from it, there's no zakat on the value of that property. There's only zakat on any retained income from your rent at the end of the year if it meets the threshold. Jazakallah. Yes. So I hope that answers your question. Jazakallah brother for calling. We'll go to the next caller. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah for calling. What's your question? I have a quick question. The barber who gives the, uh, the barber who gives the uh, forbidden haircut or shave the beard, is his income is haram or halal? Jazakallah. Is that you? Uh, no, let me ask. Is that you or somebody else? Uh, for somebody else. And um, why are you worried about the income? Just wondering. Is it because you want to eat at their house or something? Is that the reasoning? Some, so someone asked me this question. This I found this question. This I'm asking. Yeah, no, I want to reason, know the reason because does that mean that you can't accept their give? Like, what's the purpose of this question? Sorry. What's the purpose of this question? Is it because you might have to eat at this person's house, or you might have to take a gift from him? Is that the reason for the question, or is there another reason for this question? Um, uh, yes, this for uh, he wanted to give something. He wanted to give something. That's I'm asking. Okay. 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 So. Um, if you do receive money for any kind of wrong, any kind of haram, now I don't want to get into what is considered halal or haram haircut because that's a big discussion. And actually, most uh, many haircuts are not necessarily haram. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, very few haircuts are actually haram as such, like proper haram. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I wouldn't say that the majority of uh, you know majority of income would be that. Um, would be necessarily haram, mm -hmm. right? A, a part may be haram, a, a portion of it may be haram. So now let's just say that there's somebody who wants to give me a gift and they have haram income and halal income. So if they want to give a gift for me of maybe 50 pounds, for example, I am allowed to take it as long as their halal income is at least 50 pounds, or more than 50 pounds, right? Uh, so this is the opinion of many of the latest scholars like Mufti Taqi Uthmani etc uh, uh, who make very clear that you can take from somebody as long as what they're giving you that much of their income is at least halal even if uh, the rest of it is haram okay so that, that would be allowed uh, that would be allowed to take the only time you can't take from somebody is when all of their income is haram then of course you can't take from them Right, because then you're taking haram income. Right. Okay. Yeah. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. I hope that answers your question. Uh, we've got another caller. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome, Salam. Yes, sister. How are you? Fine, very well, thank you. Um, I think I've got a question regarding um, uh, ayah in the Quran. Yeah, go on. Go ahead. There's an explanation on it. It's in Surah An-Nisa, uh -huh. uh, verse 34. It talks about husbands taking care of their wives. But uh -huh. then he goes on to talk about, um, remind them of the teachings of God, then ignore them in bed, then hit them. So this uh, ayah does get used um, around. And I just wanted to have a clear explanation on the meaning behind that verse. Thank you very much. 
Okay, Jazakallah. Jazakallah for the question, sister. Shall I yes, answer that now? Yeah. Okay, so that particular question, it says, فَضْرِبُوهُنَّ yeah. uh, uh, فِي الْمَضَاجِ وَضْرِبُوهُنَّ أَنْ فَيْنَطَعْنَكُمْ فَلَا تَبْغُوا عَلَيْهِنَّ السَّبِيلَ I think in the sh short amount of time, we don't have time to discuss that in detail mm -hmm. because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding around that verse and there's a misapplication around that verse. Okay, so um, what I would suggest is that I've, I've given a very detailed covering, uh, coverage of that, an explanation of that in my book called uh, Handbook of a Healthy Muslim Marriage, right? published by White Thread Press. I would suggest that, get that if you really want a good understanding of that, get that book and read it. It's also in one of my lectures. It's just that right now, uh, we have just a few minutes left. Yeah, and if I minutes. open this discussion, I'm not going to be able to give due justice to it. And you can't leave it open-ended, right? Yeah. Because it's a very sensitive issue. You need to understand. Th however, you know, whatever the case is, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, he never hit a woman, okay? And many people, what they do is they use this verse to basically beat up their wives, Right, because it's a cultural norm to beat up their wives. That's why they do it. And then they might look at, you know, what the Quran is saying is a very, very specific procedure. Many people do not do that. They just use that as. And the way I look at it is that if you've reached the stage where to keep your wife, you need to beat her up, then what kind of a relationship is that? Like, I just can't understand that kind of relationship. Right. So that's what I would say, uh, that please uh, go and check up um, you know the the description of it in the actual detail of it, explanation of it in the book called Handbook of a Healthy Muslim Marriage, and you'll get it through whitethreadpress.com. Inshallah. We've got just one more caller. Um, yes. I know we're running short on time. If it's short, then we can answer it. Otherwise, Inshallah, we'll leave it. Salamu alaikum. Salamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Jazakallah for calling, brother. What's your question? Well, I've got my question to Mr. Sab is that if you're going to somewhere to eat, like a wedding or a function or a dawah at someone's house, uh -huh. whose duty is it to make sure that the meat is from a reliable source? Whoever is God conscious is their responsibility. So I would say it's both of their responsibilities. And I think it's a bit of a strange question because if I, I can't, I, I can't, if I know that there's a problem or there could be a problem, then it's my responsibility to find out. If I don't suspect that there's a problem at all and I think that the person is legitimate and they're considerate and they've checked it all out, then I shouldn't bother asking. But if I have any doubt, then it's my responsibility because it's what I'm eating at somebody else's house. So I wrote an article about this in detail of how you do this in a polite way, in a decent way. Right, because you don't want to turn up at yeah. somebody's house on the day and then say, brother, is this halal or not? If you've got a doubt from before. Yeah. Okay? In America, I had a constant problem with this. And again, I want to keep this short. Because in America, there's a view out there that you know, Christian meat is halal. Right? As though you know, supermarket meat is Christian meat. It's actually not necessarily the case. Most people are atheists or many people are atheists. So there's a lot of issues in there. So I would say that it is your responsibility. Right? If you have a doubt, it's your responsibility. As much as it's the responsibility of the person to feed you, but it depends on how scrupulous that person is, so ultimately it's going to end up with you. Okay, I hope that's helpful. Inshallah. Jazakallah. Jazakallah for all the callers that called. Uh, inshallah, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this one a fruitful one. Uh, from next week, inshallah, uh, as you know, uh, Azat Mufti Saab, alhamdulillah, is with us and he will be with us again next week, but next week the day will change to Wednesday. Wednesday, 9 o'clock to 10.30, inshallah, you will find us at Mufti Sab, inshallah. Uh, do call in uh, and ask your questions, inshallah, and you'll have your answer, questions answered. Jazakallah to everyone that called and made this uh, night a successful one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us all. Jazakallah for, to Mufti Sab for joining us. And we hope to see many, many more nights like this, inshallah. inshallah. Allah, bless Allah bless you. Allah bless you. Ameen. Ameen. Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.